Grüß dich. Grüß dich auch. Of course, uh, you're going to be back after the film. And we can talk about the film. And you also brought people with you. But maybe a few words before. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so for me, brevity is uh, basically the principle here. So I'm not going to take a lot of your time. I wanted to thank Panorama uh, for the invitation. It's been a very, very long process to make this movie. I read the book on an airplane uh, about 58 years ago, it feels like now. And, um, and I survived the ride. And, um, and when I landed, I got in touch with the author to try to see what we can do together as a collaboration. And what you're about to see is the result. Um, the producers are here, Malta, uh, Natasha, um, Eve, um, Piffe, Match Factory, everyone, thank you so much for supporting the movie, and ich wünsche euch gute Unterhaltung. Together with the author of the novel, is that right, with Tom McCarthy? Uh, well, but maybe you can say something about why you choose this story to be your first fictional movie. Um, I, I actually didn't write the script with Tom McCarthy. Um, Tom McCarthy is a very smart guy, and he, he knew um, he knew how to protect himself um, uh, when I approached him with the uh, the idea, or when we finally got the permission to to make the film. Uh, what we did was we met for three days in Stockholm, where he was staying at the time, and we sort of digested the novel together and created this sort of a, a diagram that's about the size of this rather large screen here. And then we um, sort of drank a lot of coffee, went to the bathroom a lot, not together, but uh, separately. And, um, and eventually we created this kind of uh, visual analog to the novel, if that's possible. And I had the, the challenge of taking this large piece of paper and putting it into a carry-on suitcase that would fit in EasyJet uh, on the way back uh, from Stockholm. So it wasn't, uh, at that point, I had a kind of a diagram of, of the book, but that's when the, the, the actual uh, writing really started. And about, uh, about the novel, uh, I, I'm an artist, so I, I make usually um, uh, films for different contexts, uh, uh, usually uh, art venues and whatnot. And the kind of works that I make uh, very often involve uh, stories uh, that people tell me, people I meet. Uh, and talk to an interview, and they often have been to situations that are, in a way, similar. Uh, they've been to intense experiences, uh, possibly traumas. They report back from something which is, for me, uh, a kind of an impossible, something that's beyond what my experience is, and then I try to sort of digest it and to create uh, a kind of a story or um, to, in, in a sense, to uh, find a way, a language to represent that. And as we know, uh, with trauma and with these kinds of experiences, uh, what happens is, of course, is that for them, in a way, time uh, stops. The traumatic event, whatever triggers it, um, uh, is something that is not the kind of memory that we usually have, where we watch a film and we go home and then we can recall uh, what's happened in the film. But we have a very stable notion of who we are, where we were in time, where the film took place. Uh, for these people, um, the, the event uh, has a tendency to disrupt this kind of notion of uh, linear time and to begin to be circular. It can reappear anywhere, it can reappear in the middle of a conversation, anything can trigger it. And I was extremely, of course, interested in, in, in this story just because it, uh, it uh, was very much about this notion of time and this notion of memory and how uh, it is circular and is repeating and is continuous and is not assimilable, it's not, you cannot assimilate it into a, a kind of a normal process. How did you know? Because for me this movie is, is, is thrilling or gripping from the first uh, scene on. You, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I was confused first because I didn't know what happened, of course that's what you intended, but how did you do it? How did you know when to reveal what and when to keep uh, it from the audience? I did not. <laughs> um, uh, you know, for me, filmmaking is a very sort of organic process, and of course, I, I write the script and I try very hard to think about what happens when. Uh, but just like the traumatized subject, uh, I uh, was in a way uh, traumatized by the process of making this film. And um, you know, as we're making it anyway, I wrote the script, uh, and when you're shooting, obviously things come up, and um, even more so afterwards when you take the footage that you've made and you take it home, take it home, take it to 
I didn't take it home. Uh, we take it to a studio and we start to edit it, then you begin to readdress the same notions of what it is that's happening structurally, temporally in the film and how to, you know, how to make sure that whatever is haunting this character, whatever this character is about, is, uh, can be compressed into uh, these 97 minutes. And then Tom's direct for me absolutely uh, carries this qualities of being on, the, on one hand very clear and concentrated, on the other hand being totally gone or confused or whatever. He has this, this quality, maybe you can say something about casting him or finding him. Um, finding Tom was actually quite uh, easy. He was um, recommended um, by someone and then we, we did a, a reading, a very short reading, and I had a very strong intuitive sense that I, I really liked it. Um, some, something about some kind of mojo thing. He had some kind of weird hairstyle thing going on. <laughs> and, and I was looking at his hair most of the time, but I, I was listening also to what he was doing and, and, and thinking that this person uh, what he what he did, uh, of course, and this is going to be banal, but these these decisions are extremely intuitive. I mean, he had extremely he, he has he has that thing that mojo that weird mojo thing. He's completely, um, you know, he's completely there and he's elsewhere. I mean, it's it's uh, there's there's uh, not much else I can say about that. I mean, it was a probably the easiest decision to make uh, making this film. <coughs> How to clothe them and what kind of suitcase and whatnot, that's way more difficult. The kind of economy that you have uh, which produces uh, films is very different than the economy that produces um, uh, filmed works for art venues. Um, and I think that if I could very, very roughly um, delineate maybe what the difference is, I mean, one is completely characterized by freedom but uh, with very little budgets. Typically people come with an exhibition or a commission in mind, and if you have an idea that you want to realize, you essentially collect the budget together, and then you produce a film, and there is very little involvement. Um, there's very little uh, cooperation, co collaboration, and interference in what you're doing. So it's an extremely, it's a laboratory that produces very personal work, and um, it's one that I'm very familiar with and very comfortable working in. And uh, film, as I know it, is a completely different animal. I mean, it's um, it's a much more, uh, it's a slower process, and it's of course uh, just a, a different uh, a different production altogether. Um, it takes a lot longer, but what the what the seduction is about is that essentially, for me at least at the time, was you can have the means to create a little world and to sort of disappear in it. And with art, uh, you know, art is like a one-night stand. You kind of meet the curator, you meet the, you know, the, you have the idea for the project, you realize it before you know it, it's over. Uh, and then you might apologize, or might, you might say, okay, that was not bad, or whatever. But uh, with, with, with film, it's, uh, it's, it's endless. <laughs> it's not over. It's never, it's, yeah, it doesn't finish. Any more questions? I think for me, what, what the characters that surround Tom are, um, they're very sort of liminal figures. They're very much on the, on the border of his perception. And what he struggles with, and possibly what the, the people watching the movie are struggling with, is the notion of their realness and how it is that they're going to actually be assert themselves in his world and become sort of full-fledged characters who demand something from him. And uh, at what point he kind of pushes them back, and at what point he begins to project these sort of ideas on them. And of course, Catherine is one of those characters. I mean, she appears out of nowhere. Uh, she disappears in the novel. She disappears on page 30. Uh, and uh, Tom is nevertheless constantly preoccupied with the past, his, his deeper past, of course, the pictures that we see, but also uh, things that surround him in the present that he's unable to uh, assimilate. And so he begins to create these little theaters, these little sort of homemade uh, theaters in order to understand what it is that the relationship is about and who this character is about and that yields this kind of uh, uh, obsessive, compulsive, uh, neurotic sort of engagement with the other and the other is in this case of course Catherine, his, his, um, his friend but uh, uh, also Greg who sort of appears and is constantly trying to touch him. I mean he's always invading his private space and Tom is always kind of pulling back. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I'm that's where they're at. I was really fascinated with this Nas figure uh, when I saw the movie the second time. I was thinking, 
it's like some kind of the devil's advocate or something, somebody who's, you know, doing something that he's told, but it, maybe you can say something about him. Does he look like in the book, or is he described in the book like, like he is in your movie? I think Arshur did a lovely job. Um, and, um, I mean, Nas in the book is dis described as a, a South Asian, um, uh, Southeast Asian character. And um, I always think of Remainder, the sort of the social context for what happens in Remainder. Uh, there's a, the, this post-colonial sort of fairy tale that's happening around it. We have this, this kind of white guy who's jettisoned. You know, he's catapulted into a, a world that he doesn't recognize. And he has the means, uh, and he eventually has the technology to begin to conquer that world. And uh, he does that with the aid of uh, uh, Nas, who is a kind of a producer, a fixer, a sort of enable and eventually, an enabler, and eventually also uh, a, a kind of, a, in a strange way, a sort of a paramour, or a kind of a, a, a love interest in a way. Um, and then, of course, the people who are always having to move out and to suffer as a consequence of his actions are the people who are uh, in that space, who are more native to that space. And so, if Remainder has a social context, it is a context of. Uh, that relates to, for me at least, a post-colonial context, but also a context of gentrification. I mean, he's given money, uh, and he begins to buy spaces with that money, move people in, move people out, uh, and realize fantasies that have very little to do with what the um, local situation is about. Uh, remember, the right, music was done by Schneider TM, yes. um, is from Berlin, which is also very wonderful, I think. And um, and I read there that I, I read the first time that you also uh, shot um, some of the scenes in Berlin. Maybe you can say something about that just for me because I'm interested. But Dirk's, Dirk should be here. Um, Dirk Dresselhaus. There he is. Yeah, we shot uh, four weeks in London and two weeks uh, here in Berlin, um, which were the best two weeks of this shooting at all, because I, I live very close to where we were shooting for the most part. Uh, so, yeah, the law office is in uh, Hakkashel Markt. Uh, the restaurant where they meet each other and have a talk is uh, Voigt in Neukölln. Um, and the hospital, which has been trimmed to just a couple of brief uh, images, is just outside uh, of Berlin, somewhere near Potsdam, somewhere in the boonies. Um, and when Tom is running down the street, uh, it's on Friedrichstrasse. Um, so, um, yeah, of course, uh, we try to avoid um, the German McDonald's and whatnot as much as possible. Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, of course, the, the brief was simple. We have to, we have to shoot indoors. The party, the party scene at Greg's house was also here in, in Friedrichshain. So we essentially covered very highly gentrified areas in Berlin and, um, and used them as a backdrop for London, which is itself has been on this kind of uh, mega gentrification um, um, roller coaster for the last uh, 15, 20 years or so. Yeah. So um, um, you talked a little bit about that already, but I'm still curious. Um, compare if you compare these two things, like uh, the creativity and working as a video artist and working as a director now. Can you say something about that? Is it more or as I suppose it is less creativity or freedom of creativity because you have so much things to think about when you have a movie with so much money and people and all these people that have to work with you. Uh, I think in the end, as an artist, it's easier to have a, a, a personal imprint on the work that you're doing just because it's it's a quicker process and it's a process that is a lot less deliberative. So it's something that's very much more immediate. And I think inevitably, at least in the filmmaking that I know, and I only know this through, um, through a remainder, um, you know, you have to buy rights, and then you have to develop a, a, a script, and of course people are involved in the development, and uh, they have a lot of input in what happens uh, along the process. And so, you know, uh, by the time I made this movie, I eventually, I, we started, we got the rights, I think uh, sometime in 2011, uh, Natasha's here somewhere, 10, 2010. Um, and we, um, and I think in that time I made one, two, three, four works, uh, four artworks uh, in, in between, and also had a child. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a long, it's a long process. I mean, I didn't have the child, my wife had the child. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, so do we have any more questions?
Essentially, in an art context, things happen like they begin to happen now. People begin to move in the space a lot. People come in, uh, they leave, they come in at any time. And so the work is playing constantly, but the audience is moving. And uh, in a cinema context, at least in mainstream cinema, uh, not experimental cinema, you, you know the ritual. You buy the ticket, you buy your beer, you buy the popcorn, you sit down and you know that you're in for 90 plus minutes of entertainment. Um, you know, in the art world, it's it's a lot more open and it's a lot more chaotic. And so that, I take that sort of notion of, of temporality and causality and I play with it quite a bit um, as an artist because I know that my audience is only there briefly and that I need to catch that audience's attention and to try to keep it there. And what I'm interested in is having people engage with the work at different times and coming with different conclusions, coming out with different conclusions about what's happening. If you have a linear presentation like you have here, you're, um, you know, you have a chance to tell out a story, to, to, to flush out a story to possibly to a greater degree, uh, but you don't have that sort of, that, that sort of marketplace kind of uh, train station sort of feel that I really like about what the art world offers. Well, the loop, the loop. I mean, the, the novel, the novel ends with the protagonist. I don't know if you've read the book, but the novel doesn't end this way. The in in the novel, um, the protagonist um, actually hires charters an airplane, and he gets in this airplane, and he, um, he he commandeers it, and he's got a weapon with him, and the authorities find out that um, that he's there, and they command the pilot to to fly it back, and then he threatens the pilot with a gun, and he says, "Keep flying." just keep flying it, and they keep saying, come back, keep flying. So he ends up flying in a figure eight or in a circle. So, and, and the character arrives at this moment of stasis, at this moment of equilibrium, and at this moment of grace, uh, uh, which I thought was a very beautiful uh, image, but we didn't have any fucking money to buy an airplane and to, you know, to fly him around in an airplane. So I thought of taking that figure eight and literally applying it to the script and so that the script itself has this kind of Mobius quality to it and it begins and ends, it flies also in the circle and then of course in the linear uh, telling you have this moment of grace and what this, what, 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 for me, and I just saw the, the very few, last few minutes of the, the film, what the, after all the work that he does and shifting all these bodies around and trying so hard to, you know, to, to put his little pieces together in order to understand what his relationship is and how he can place himself within a, a greater social environment, he arrives at this moment of pause, at this moment of grace at the end. And um, I don't mean grace, I mean grace in a very sort of uh, uh, sort of new age spiritual kind of way. I'm not a religious guy, but I think it's, there's a very sort of beatific moment at the end when he kind of is finally able to rest and have pause and to close his eyes and understand have a sense of wholeness of, of himself before uh, the, the, the machine will, will restart, the, the big computer will reboot and he'll have to uh, redo things again. So I just took the, the, the kind of the, the symbol or the, the image, the, light, the, the sort of this motif at the very end of the book and, and literally twisted the plot in order to accommodate this. Yeah. <laughs>